Well, back in the uh, winter, in January of this year, the stomach bug came to the Griffiths household. Uh, and as a lot of you guys know, we've got two boys. And so if you're a parent and you have children and the stomach bug makes it win your house, it's time to lock the house down because it's coming for everyone. Uh, and uh, I am particularly afraid of the stomach bug. I get very nervous about it. Um, ever since I was a kid, I just don't like it. Uh, and <clears throat> what happened was that our youngest, Ben, uh, who was just a baby at the time, uh, he, was, he was feeling a little ill, and I, uh, there was something in me that was telling me, there is something wrong. This is not a normal, this is not just like a baby upset stomach. Uh, and then sure enough, our, our second son, Jonathan, who's older, he said that his tummy hurt, and then pretty soon we saw that his tummy hurt because his tummy hurt came out everywhere all over the bedroom. Uh, and at that point, I knew, okay, we got to lock this down because I do not want to get sick. I, this, this can't come for me. So I head out to get myself some nice rubber gloves from CVS. Uh, I get face masks. I get more cans of Lysol than is rational for a person to have inside of their house. And sure enough, while I was at CVS, my wife calls me and she says, it's happened to me. I've gotten ill too. So I knew, okay, th this has got to be kind of a zero tolerance policy right now. So I get home, I isolate everybody in their own rooms. I, I soak every piece of furniture we have in Lysol. And I'm not kidding, that evening, I slept with rubber gloves on. <laughs> I slept with a face mask on, on a couch that was so damp that there was Lysol running down my face. <laughs> but I did not get the stomach bug. I avoided it. I managed to get out of there. Now, this morning we are talking about wrestling with Jesus. And we are talking about wrestling with Jesus about sex. And I tell that story because so often, the way that the world perceives what Jesus says about sex is as though he treats it as though it's this terrible illness that we have to avoid at all costs. That we have to be almost clinical about it. That if we talk about it or relate to it, we do it with rubber gloves on. We do it from a distance. We don't engage too much with the topic. But the truth is, is what Jesus says about sex is actually, I think, the most liberating way to think and talk about sex that there is. Jesus has the most liberating sexual ethic of anyone who has ever lived. And I'm excited to talk about it today because as awkward as it can be, and as kind of off-putting as it can be for us sometimes, what Jesus has to say about it is good news. He has a better story than the story that our culture tells about sex. So let's dive right in. This morning we are looking at Matthew's gospel in chapter 5, and we're looking at verses 27 through 30. This is what Jesus says. He says, you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. We are in the midst of this bigger series with Jesus. And the last few weeks we have been talking about wrestling with Jesus. Seeing the conversations that Jesus had about some of the most controversial hot topics that are out there. And how we think about them and how Jesus thinks about them. And trying to let that affect the way that we think about these things. Trying to let what Jesus says about this guide us as we wrestle with him. And we come to probably the one that is uh, the one we are most curious about, let's say. And at the same time, the one that we are most hesitant to talk about. We're curious because we live in a culture that is absolutely sec saturated with discussion about sex. It's in advertisements, it is in music, it is in entertainment. It's all around us. And so naturally, as human beings, we have questions. Well, what does God actually really truly think about this? What does he say about it in his word? And at the same time, we're hesitant because our culture is so saturated with discussion about it that we don't really know how we are supposed to talk about it. We don't really know what is it that we're supposed to engage with, what are we not supposed to engage with, how are we supposed to think about it in general. Sex has become so distorted in our culture that we don't know what we think. So how could we ever hope to have a conversation? So it's actually, again, really good news that this morning we come to what Jesus says to help him guide us, to help him, 
to have him help us see rightly about what the better story that God has about sex. And so today we're going to look at three things in this passage together. We are going to look at a deeper reality. We are going to look at a drastic response. And we're going to look at a deeper desire. So let's jump right in with a deeper reality. Let's see what Jesus has to say. Now, how much do you guys know about ice bags? Probably most of y'all's only response is, I know one sank the Titanic. But ice bags are actually really interesting things to read about. I think that there's many, many facts about ice bags that are very interesting. And did you know, for example, that the average weight of an ice bag is 100,000 to 200,000 tons? that most of them on average are equivalent to the size of a cubic 15-story building. One of the biggest icebergs ever actually broke free from Antarctica. It was called B-15. And amazingly, it was 183 miles long, 23 miles wide, and had a total surface area of 4,250 square miles. That is one colossal object. But if you know anything at all about icebergs, you know that what's most interesting about an iceberg is what we see in this picture here, that 90% of an iceberg's mass and volume is below the surface of the water. Icebergs actually extend down about 600 to 700 feet below the waterline. So when we look at that picture there, we are seeing an object that has tremendous weight, tremendous volume, but what's visible to us, and really what we take notice of most of the time, is only 10% of what's actually there. When we talk about sex in our culture, most of the discussions deal with about 10% of what it actually is. Most of what sex truly is lies beneath the surface. There is more meaning, there is more weight to what it is that doesn't get discussed. And when Jesus starts talking about it here, he kind of wants to open up the idea of what it is and why it's so important. So what he says is, you've heard it said that you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Right here, Jesus is in the middle of his most famous sermon that he preaches in the Gospels. It's called the Sermon of the Mount. Most of us have heard of it if we haven't read it. And in this sermon, Jesus is unpacking for all of the crowds the Ten Commandments. He's kind of going through systematically each of God's commands to the people about life and about how they should live and helping them understand them better. And in most cases, what Jesus does is he comes to the commandment and he says, you've heard it said, and then he opens it up further than they've really heard before. And there's no difference when he comes to the commandment on adultery. Now, the commandment for adultery was there to protect God's design for sex. God, no matter how shy we are to talk about it, God has never been shy in talking about sex. It's one of the first things that comes up in Genesis after he's created human beings. And God creates these commandments as he reveals himself to his people to protect something that in God's eyes is deeply precious and deeply important. And Jesus comes to this and he wants to talk about it because it's so important. Now the difference between what Jesus is doing and what's been done previously is that most people when they hear God give them a rule or a commandment, they think about it purely in terms of this is what you do, this is what you don't do. And what Jesus is going to do is he's going to go further than that. And he's saying, I don't want you to simply think about what you do or don't do. I want you to think about why. With each of these commandments throughout the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus is trying to get the people to see behind the commandments of God to why he gave them. Why does God say, don't commit adultery? Now, if we go back into the Old Testament, we find passages about sex that quite honestly, I would be uh, a little too embarrassed to share with you this morning. Because the way it talks about it is deeply graphic, deeply intimate. There are entire books dedicated to the topic. But perhaps one that I'm okay with sharing with you this morning is the story of Adam and Eve. Because in the very first few chapters of the Bible, Adam is introduced to his wife. And the old kind of joke goes that when he looks upon Eve, he says, whoa, man. And that's how she gets her name. (laughs) And it's not too far from the truth because as Eve comes towards him, what happens in Genesis 2 and Genesis 1 is that Adam breaks into song. That when he beholds this woman, when he sees her, 
He can't help but sing, born of my born, flesh of my flesh. He sings and breaks out into this incredible Hebrew poetry about how much desire, how much love, how much uh, attraction is going on between him and Eve. And I, I don't think I need to remind you that Eve at this moment and Adam at this moment are both naked and unashamed. Adam is beholding his wife in all of her glory and singing about what is happening within his soul when he looks at her. And in that moment, sex is created. God says, for this reason, a man uh, shall leave his mother and father and be cleaved to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. God is saying, what's happening out of this desire that you have, Adam, out of this moment of deep desire for your wife, there is going to come a moment of complete unity between you. Unity emotionally, unity spiritually, unity even physically. And so you see, sex from the very beginning is about far more than just physicality. Sex in the Bible is about a deep union between two human beings within the covenant of marriage. And God designs this covenant of marriage to protect this incredibly sacred union. And so from the get-go, he designs it as one man and one woman bound together in a covenant for life. There's very little that we can really apply to try and understand a covenant because a covenant is so unique from everything else. Most of the time we talk about marriage vows and a covenant is kind of a promise to one another, but it goes far, far deeper than that. And the reason it does is because God wants to protect this incredibly sacred thing. So you see, the Bible's perspective on sex is incredibly positive, actually far more positive than our own cultures. The way that we think about sex is usually the 10% above the water. But God is saying there is so much more meaning, there is so much more to this below the surface. And when we try and isolate the physicality of sex away from everything else that God designed it to be, then we actually degrade what God has created it to be. This is what C.S. Lewis says about sex outside of marriage. He says, the monstrosity of sex outside of marriage is that those who indulge in it are trying to isolate one union from all other kinds of union, which are meant to go along with it and make up a total union. The Christian attitude doesn't mean that there is anything wrong about sexual pleasure at all. Rather, it means that you mustn't isolate that pleasure and try to get it by itself any more than you ought to try to get the pleasure of taste without swallowing and digesting, but instead by chewing things and spitting them out again. One interesting analogy Lewis has there for what this is, and I think that he hits the nail on the head. I think that what is tragic about sex outside of marriage is that it is isolating one part, the 10% of the iceberg, from the entire rest of it. It's not even a majority part of what it is. But that's the culture that we live in. That's how our culture tends to think about this topic. And Jesus comes to it and says, I want you to think more deeply about this. I don't even want you to think about this in terms of doing it or not doing it. I want you to think about what's going on in your heart. Jesus takes the commandment further. He says, you've heard it said that you shouldn't commit adultery. I'm telling you that if you have even looked on a woman or a man lustfully in your heart, then you've already committed adultery. Jesus is saying, look below the surface. Look below the surface of what is actually going on and ask yourself, how are you viewing the other person in your mind? How do you think about sex? How do you think about the opposite sex? If sex is something that is used purely for selfish pleasure, then it's being reduced from what it was in the, in, in the beginning, which is an act of giving one's whole self to someone else out of love and devotion. What sex outside of marriage does is it reduces people to mere objects for our sexual pleasure. It isolates sex from a relationship and makes it about meeting our selfish desires. Jesus may well have said in our day, if you look upon a woman with lust, you've already abused her. Because Jesus' point isn't merely that you are or are not committing a sexual sin. It's that the way that you are viewing someone, the way that you are considering someone, the way that you are 
Honoring the image of God within that person is being degraded when you do this outside of the covenant of marriage. Jesus wants us to get the deeper reality. He wants us to see the importance of this, the positivity of it, the glory of it, so that we may enjoy it as God intended. And so Jesus has a drastic response to how to deal with sex and sexual desire. That's the second thing we see, a drastic response. Now, probably around this time of the year, a lot of us are lighting up a bonfire. Uh, it's the weather for it. It's nice to go outside and eat some s'mores. And so we see here a nice little bonfire that you'd like to get around. Now, on Monday, the 5th of November, it is a special holiday in England that some of you may have heard of. It's called Bonfire Night. And across the nation, most English people start a bonfire in their backyard to commemorate uh, the death of someone called Guy Fawkes. Now, I'm being polite when I say the death. What I really mean is we are celebrating the time we burned Guy Fawkes to death on a bonfire because we are a very messed up country. That's the kind of things that we celebrate. We even go as far as to create uh, a little, someone that we call the Guy, where we take a scarecrow and we throw it on the fire. Uh, so it's, I, I do, I'm not sure how I would try and explain that to my children when we grow up and we throw this hu like supposed human carcass on the bonfire. Uh, it's kind of dark. But what bonfire night is really the most of a headache for is for the fire department. Because as you can imagine, if you work in the fire department in England and you've got most everyone starting a fire in their backyard, you are in for a stressful evening. <laughs> because when you start a fire... Fires can very quickly get out of control. And very soon, a little fire like that can end up looking a little bit like this. And it's common around fireworks times. If we are on, think about July the 4th, if we think about times where we might be doing bonfires, there are rules that you have to abide by to make sure that that doesn't happen. Because actually, that can happen far quicker than we realize. Everything will move in that direction. We can't be apathetic about the way that we use fire and start fires because very quickly it can get out of control. We have to be proactive and thoughtful about how we do it. And the same is true about sex. Sex is like a fire that can very quickly get out of control. And if you want to avoid it getting out of control, then you can't be half-hearted about how you approach it. You've got to think very carefully about how you think about it and how you engage in the idea of it. Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It's a very dramatic passage. I think this is probably one of the passages that those uh, outside of the church look at and they think about the sexual ethic of Christianity and say, wow, that seems so harsh. In fact, when Jimmy Carter was president, some of you might remember that he quoted this passage and he talked about this passage and people uh, reacted very poorly to it, that he got a lot of criticism for using it because they thought it was kind of a backwards idea. But Jesus doesn't think it's a backwards idea. When he gets to this passage, Jesus uses this very interesting word to talk about lust. He uses a Greek word, epithemeo. And the root of epithemeo is, is a word, epithemia, and epithemia is the word used for idolatry. So what Jesus is doing is he's drawing a line between sexual lust and idolatry. He's saying when you have idolatry in your heart towards sex, when you have a desire out of control in your heart towards sex, then you've already committed adultery. You've already broken the idea of what sex is supposed to be. When we think about idolatry, what Jesus is trying to get us to recognize is that sexual desire out of control is the same thing as idolatry in that you are making something that is intended to be very good into something that is ultimate, something that gives you fulfillment, something that defines you. And God never intended for sex to bear the weight of that. And when we do that, we do it at the expense of ourselves and other people. When we let the fire get out of control, it causes damage to us and others. We live in a culture, as I've said, that is saturated with an idea of sex. And it is, 
quite literally a fire that has gone out of control. Did you know, for example, that every single second there are over 28,000 people viewing pornography? That a quarter of all internet searches are regarding pornography. In 2016, one of the leading pornography web websites had 91 billion videos downloaded. That is enough for 12, that's 12.5 videos for every living human being on earth. And that was just one website. There are hundreds, if not thousands. It's a very interesting book uh, by a couple of sociologists that work for the Population Center called Premarital Sex in America. And these two sociologists decided they were going to investigate what is the cultural narrative about sex? What do people say about it? So they conducted a multiple year study, asked people all kinds of questions, and they discovered that our culture has something called sexual scripts. And what they meant by that is that there is ideas in our minds about what sex should be, what it should look like, how we should relate to it, and people kind of follow these scripts out in their life. One of the scripts, for example, might be that pornography doesn't hurt relationships. People believe that, they think that, and so they engage with it as though that's, that's the script. That's what they're set with. But what these two sociologists discovered as well is that these scripts were often very, very wrong. What the masses thought about sex and the way they related to sex were actually very contrary to what empirical data would suggest. For example, pornography does affect relationships. People who use pornography have crushing expectations about the appearance and the behavior of their partners. Men who use pornography are far less willing to get involved in re real relationships, and so marriages declined along in parallel with the increase in use of pornography. We could go on and on and on and on and reel off fact after fact about the destruction that is brought about when sexual desire gets out of control. And when we try and satisfy this desire in all of these different places. And this is why, as taboo as the subject is, it's so important. Because even if we are not talking about it, the world is. The world has opinions and ideas about this. And it's very clear to see that they are causing pain and suffering. From something that was intended to be beautiful and sacred and good to be enjoyed. So Jesus has this graphic suggestion of gouging out your eye and cutting off your hand. The Christian view of sex is that we must carefully consider how we live and engage with the world so that we don't become enslaved and dominated by the things that God intended to be good. Paul says in his letter to the Corinthians, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Sexual desire can dominate you. It can enslave you. And it happens when we let our eyes feed our imagination and when we let our hands engage with the world in ways that are unhelpful. Jesus isn't literally saying, gouge out your eye, cut off your hand. Of course, we know that because a person without eyes and hands can still struggle with lust. What Jesus is saying instead is your eye, which is the primary way in which you view the world, you need to think about how you're viewing the world. And if there is any way at all that you are viewing the world, which is encouraging temptation, you must cut it off. You must get rid of it. If there are TV shows that you watch that cause certain movies to be played in your mind and certain ideas to come up in your mind, then perhaps you shouldn't watch that TV show. If there are certain places that you go and people that you look at, that when you are in that situation, it's staring up your imagination to sinful places, then perhaps you need to think about how you are viewing those situations, what you are feeding your imagination with. Maybe you need to allow access to your devices to other people around you. Maybe you need to get involved in accountability groups. Whatever it takes, do it is what Jesus is saying. It's worth it. It's not worth being dominated by this. It's not worth being enslaved by this. It's not worth the fire getting out of control, whatever it takes. And when you feel that gnawing voice inside of you that says, isn't this a little drastic? Isn't this a little over the top? 
Remind yourself, no, it's not. It's worth it to preserve something that is beautiful, something that is sacred, something that God has intended that's even better than what most of the world says. We take this very seriously at our church. It's something that we care about. We have a a care ministry called Compass for men who struggle with sexual desire and temptation. And that's there because we want to provide a private and safe place for people to be able to find support and encouragement. Because again, it's not easy, but it is worth it to be free from being a slave to sexual desire. It's worth some minor convenience so that we may get the better story, so that we may find the deeper desire. That's the last thing that Jesus tries to open us up to in this passage, is a deeper desire. I said at the very beginning that God's commands are always about protecting something good. But when God issues commands to us, he is trying to create boundaries that preserve something that's good for us. And in this situation, God is trying to preserve something that he wants us to enjoy as a good. Jesus finishes by saying, it's better for you to lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. The irony is most of us read that and are just filled with fear about where we don't want to go. And we miss that Jesus says, it is better at the start of that sentence, which implies there is something better that Jesus is trying to get us to. Jesus is not wanting us to be filled with fear about what might happen when we get this wrong. He's wanting us to have hope and excitement about what might happen when we get this right. He has got a better story for us. Jesus told two parables in the New Testament in the Gospel of Matthew about hidden treasure and pearls of great value. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Contrary to the notion that Jesus or God is trying to squash desire within us. The truth is he is trying to liberate it. He is trying to help us find it being fulfilled in him in the kingdom of heaven. Psalm 145 says about God, you open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. That's the better story. That's the better story of who God is, of what God wants to do in our lives, is satisfy every desire. Every desire that is in us actually points towards Him. Every single desire, including sexual desire, is a signpost towards a giver who has put these desires and needs within us. It didn't slip in by accident. God wasn't like, wow, I didn't expect them to do that. This is an intention by God, a good gift. And friends, the giver of the gift is always better than the gift. Sex is good, but its goodness points towards something even greater, a one who can satisfy the desires of our heart in ways that nothing else can. How do we know him? How can we come to this rescuer? who fulfills our every need. We come to him in repentance and faith. We need to start being honest about what's going on in our hearts and minds regarding sex. We need to be honest of our need for him to be with us, to help us, to forgive us in the ways that we have failed. If, if you are someone who has failed in this area and as we talk about this, you're saying, well, what about me when I've crossed this line already? What hope is there for me? There is every hope. Because in the New Testament, there's a woman brought before Jesus who's accused of committing adultery, breaking the very command that Jesus says not to break in this passage. And they throw her down before Jesus. And you know what Jesus says to her? I don't condemn you. The hope of the gospel is that even though we fail to get this right sometimes, even though we struggle through this, there is one who can satisfy the desires of our heart 
and who could bring us to a better story of what sex really is. Spending more time praying and asking God to show up than we do drowning ourselves in culture that is infatuated with sex will bring us to one who can satisfy us in ways that we never thought possible. Single or married. So for us this morning, I want us to remember three things. I want us to see the deeper reality that sex is far more than what we are told it is. It is about a deep union of souls that glorifies and points us towards God. I want us to take drastic action and be serious about the struggles that we face so that we can preserve and protect something that God intended to be good and beautiful and sacred. And lastly, I want us to seek after the deeper desire of God himself, the giver of the gift, who himself can satisfy the longings of our heart. Let's pray as we close this morning. Father, I thank you that you are a giver of good gifts. That what you have given us in sex is a sacred, beautiful, and wonderful thing. And Lord, this morning we rejoice in your goodness in giving it to us. And Lord, we pray that as we wrestle with this subject, that Lord, that you would be with us. That your voice would be central and primary. That we would listen to the good news that you have about it that we would trust in you. Lord, we come now to your table and respond to your word by remembering what it is that you did for us. That, Lord, those of us who have failed in this area, those of us who struggle with this, Lord, can come to this table and be reminded that you do not condemn us, but that you give your whole self, that you give your body and your blood for us. Lord, we rejoice in you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.